Okay, now we're going to apply the picture. We know, let's, let's assume the second case we've listed here, where we know V naught, VF, and delta T. Now, just without even necessarily thinking about the meanings of these quantities, we can map out how to move through this problem. Then we're going to talk about the meanings and how that enhances our understanding and how by practice, uh, by running through all the different possibilities, we can become adept at reasoning and understanding uniformly accelerated motion. So if we know V naught, VF, and delta T, okay, let's just take a pair of these quantities. Let's take V naught and VF. Is there any triangle up here that contains both V naught and VF? If there is, we're going to be able to use those two quantities to determine a third. Well, uh, you should figure that out. Look at these triangles, see what we have for V naught and VF. You can immediately see that V naught and VF give us V bar. And you should know how you get V bar from V naught and VF. But I'm just going to say, okay, V naught, VF gives us V bar. And that's our third triangle. Also, we have VF and V naught gives us delta V. So So you see, if we look at this list, we know V naught, VF, and delta T. And we've just determined from only V naught and VF what delta V and V bar would have to be. And we're left only trying to find delta S and A. OK, so now we know these four quantities. Can we find a triangle that involves two of these quantities? Of course, either of these triangles will involve two of the quantities, but we now know all three quantities, or yeah, we, we know that we're going to be able to reason out all three quantities uh, for each of these triangles, so they're not going to do us any more good. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, v naught and delta V. Do V naught and delta V give us anything? Well, they give us VF, but we know VF, so that doesn't help us. Okay, now I'm going to pause with every question. You should pause the video and think through every question as I pause, okay? Okay, so V naught and delta V doesn't help us. V naught and V bar doesn't help us because all that gets us is VF, and we already know VF. Similarly, VF paired with either of these quantities is not going to get us anywhere. And that just goes back to what we said about having already exhausted the possibilities for these two triangles. And these two triangles, none of them involve V naught and delta V or VF and delta V or any of the other things we just considered. So let's go to delta T and delta V. Do we see anything up here that involves delta T and delta V? Well, yeah, this triangle. Okay, so delta T and delta V give us our acceleration. I'm not going to put the bar over the acceleration. I could, but since the acceleration is uniform due to this, we don't need it. Uh, and that's the second triangle. Okay? Then what? Well, now we know A. The only thing we've got left is delta S. And delta S only occurs in one place. So here's delta S. And do we know V bar and delta T? Well, yeah, we've now determined this, and now we're going to have delta S. Okay, so V bar and delta T give us delta S. That's from the first Okay, now, uh, all, all this reasoning wouldn't be worth a whole lot if there wasn't a lot of insight to be gained by the reasoning. So let's stop and think how we would combine V naught and VF to get V bar.
then how we would combine them to get delta V, how we would combine delta T and delta V to get A, V bar and delta T to get S. So, how would we combine V naught and VF to get V bar? You should think about that, but if you go back to the definition, well, to the implications of a straight line graph, a straight line graph implies that V bar equals the average, the average velocity V bar equals the average of the initial and final velocities. So, trying to get an average velocity and you've got two velocities, you just average them. So that's how we calculate V bar. How do we get V naught and VF to give delta V? Well, that's very straightforward. Delta means change in. To get the change from an initial to a final, make the statement by the meaning of delta. Delta V is equal to VF minus V naught. Okay, now how do delta T and delta V go together? Well, delta T and delta V are related within the definition of average uh, in the implications that we get from the definition of average acceleration. So the definition of average acceleration and I'll abbreviate average acceleration by A bar implies dot 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 which implies that A bar equals delta V over delta T. Where the dots here are the connection between the definition of average acceleration as average rate of change of velocity with respect to clock time. Applying the rate of change definition, we get this. And again, you need to go back to the very basic definition. You need to be able to understand that very basic definition to fully understand what this is telling you. So that we get this, and then here, how are V bar, delta T, and delta S related? Well, they come from the definition of average velocity. So we can write that out. And I'm going to do that off camera so you don't have to sit there and watch me write it. So the direct consequence, if you start with the definition of average velocity and apply the definition of average rate of change, you get the relationship for V bar, which is delta S over delta T. And then clearly, if we know uh, V bar and delta T, then we multiply V bar by delta T to get delta S, just like in the preceding step. Uh, if we know delta T and delta V, we can directly calculate A bar just by doing the division. Now let's go ahead and go through the process if we know V naught, VF, and delta T to have the values I've written here. We go from 20 meters per second to 5 meters per second in 3 seconds. Let's just go in order. Uh, v naught and VF give us V bar. So, V bar is V naught plus VF over 2 not VF minus V naught over 2. It's, again, an average velocity is the average of the two velocities, depending, again, on the fact that a straight line V versus T graph. Uh, if it's not straight, then uh, we're not going to likely have that average. But that is going to equal what? Well, that's 20 meters per second plus 5 meters per second over 2, which is 12.5 meters per second. We have our average velocity. Okay, now we know V naught, VF, and our average velocity. So we've got V naught, VF, and V bar. What can we do next? 
Well, we've got delta T that we can put together with V bar. And I'm, I'm deviating. Um, I'm, I'm down to this step here, which is okay. We can do that at this point. And we can do this. But let's first go ahead and get, well, we can't do this till we get delta V. So let's go ahead and finish with V naught and VF. So if we know V naught and VF, we can find delta V. That's very straightforward. Delta V is VF minus V naught. And I'm not going to write out all the calculations, obviously. We, well, I'd better because we're going to get a negative here. That's 20 meters per second. It isn't because VF is 5 meters per second. So let me pause, and I'll probably write it out uh, off camera. OK, so a delta V is VF minus V naught. Our final velocity, 5 meters per second, minus our initial 20 meters per second. That's negative 15 meters per second perfectly appropriate that that be negative because we end up slower than we started. Our change in velocity is negative. Okay, well let's go in order of what we did here. We could do either this or this, doesn't matter which we do first, but I chose this one simply because I found delta T matching up with V bar before I found delta S uh, matching up, or delta T matching up with delta V and therefore delta S. Uh, so, okay, we know delta T and delta V. How do we get the acceleration? Well, the definition of average acceleration is the average rate of change of velocity with respect to clock time. By the definition of the average rate of change, that's change in velocity divided by change in clock time, which we designate delta V over delta T. So now, A bar is delta V over delta T. And that equals negative 15 meters per second over 3 seconds. And I'm not going to explain the units here because uh, this is something everybody needs to be working on. And we've talked plenty about it now, so I don't want to divert ourselves. But that becomes 3 and negative 15 is negative 5 meters per second divided by seconds is meters per second squared. Okay, now finally, V bar and delta T. Okay, the definition of average velocity is the average rate of change of position with respect to clock time. By the definition of rate of change, that is change in position divided by change in clock time, which is delta S over delta T. So we get V bar equals delta S over delta T. Okay. And delta S as we go. So, okay, never mind. We don't know delta S. We're trying to find delta S. And by solving this equation, we multiply both sides by delta T, as we should well know by now. We get V bar delta T. And that's going to be what? OK. Our V bar is 12 and a half meters per second. Our delta T is 3 seconds. And when we multiply that out, we get 37.5 meters. We see then how this scheme can be useful in mapping out a solution if we're given three variables. <coughs> and if we then think about how the combinations of variables work out, in other words, if we think about the relationships involved with each of these, we can determine specifically how we're going to calculate each of the new quantities so that we end up with all seven of our quantities known. Then we can think through exactly what each calculation means in terms of given numbers. In the process, hopefully developing a much deeper insight than we would get if we just use the equations of uniformly accelerated motion, which in this course we have not seen to date, but which actually uh, simplify the process of getting an answer, but they don't necessarily contribute well to the process of understanding what it is that we're doing, except plugging quantities into equations. <coughs>